I'm very excited because today we're doing perhaps one of my favorite topics in the whole world, and that is meditation in Kashmir Shaivism. We're going to look at um, what meditation is. See, Friday we do our meditation class, and today we're going to look at the modality known as Kashmir Shaivism, a particular approach to meditation that I think is incredibly unique, dynamic, exciting. Um, it's a creative process, so it's, it's a lot of fun to talk about. So let's, of course, as you know, um, these classes have to start with a chant or a dog's lick of the face. You know, dogs are Shiva's jackals. Jackals are Shiva and uh, Kali's animals. The wild dogs of the cremation ground, that's like they're familiar. <laughs> All right. Hello, Julie. Uh, Julie's coming. Okay, so we're going to discuss Kashmir Shaivism and the meditation techniques therein. And of course, uh, we must begin with a chant. Actually, before we begin with the chant, let me just say one thing about why we're going to chant what we're going to chant. See, Kashmir is a place in India, um, and its central city is Srinagar, a very rich and wonderful kingdom in the 10th and 11th centuries. Right before the Mughal invasion uh, of the 12th century, Kashmir was enjoying an unprecedented period of cultural uh, flourishment, fl uh, efflorescence. You know, the, there was the highest level of the arts and of um, philosophy and spirituality. So naturally, there were a lot of wealthy patrons, much like the Medici's in Italy, who were um, starting temples and creating safe spaces for teachers to come and practice spirituality and teach spirituality and write books and, and all of that. So it was a really fertile environment for the practice of spirituality and the codification of its philosophies. And Kashmir, in the 10th century, from the period of 900 AD to 1050 or 1180 produced a series of astounding, brilliant philosophers that are polymaths, you know, and foremost amongst them is Abhinava Gupta, who is a great writer of dance. He commented a lot on Indian art. So he has essays on dance. He has essays on aesthetic theory and Sanskritist people who study Sanskrit might actually be more familiar with his aesthetic theory, his axiology than with his spiritual theory. You know, so he's known in art circles too, as like this aesthetic par excellence. Now, of course, those who study his spiritual works will see the clear influence between the two modes, the, the artistic writing and the spiritual writing. Clearly, tantric philosophy is an aesthetic philosophy. Because on one hand, Abhinava Gupta, the great polymath, is a commentator on dance, on poetry, on theater, on uh, art. But on the other hand, predominantly, he is a tantric master. Of, of, of a sort no one in India had ever seen before. He had 17 gurus. He was initiated into three very powerful lineages, the Kaula, the Trika, and the Krama. And in his lifetime, he synthesized all three of those lineages into something fervently new, excitingly new. And more than anything, Abhinava Gupta's work in the field of Tantra, in the field of Indian spirituality, has lent a cohesion and a unity, tying together a bunch of diverse streams of philosophy that would otherwise look very discreet and, and particular. But thanks to Abhinava, they've all become united under this one umbrella of Shaivism or non-dual Kashmir Shaivism. So when anybody says Kashmir Shaivism, essentially what they're talking about is the Shaiva exegesis of Tantra that happened between the years 900 to 1050 AD. So when we say exegesis, we mean like commentarial writing on scripture. The Tantras themselves are a set of scriptures that profilerated in India between the um, maybe sixth century AD, all the way up to present modern day India. The gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is in my opinion a Tantra. And so like that. Um, tantras are, are scriptures. They appear throughout Indian history since at least the 5th century. Some will argue that the Taittiriya Upanishad itself is a Tantra. And many will argue that like texts like the Brahma Yamala Tantra and, and these texts maybe are even pre-Vedic. They're shamanic and have folk origins. So they might even be older than the Upanishads. I don't know. Uh, every, like, everyone likes to make claims. But at the very least, we can say this. From the 5th century or 6th century AD onwards, you get a series of texts styling themselves as Tantras. Or they might be called the Maha Nirvana Tantra or the Kula Arnava Tantra or the what, Rudra Yamala Tantra or whatever. They each have the word Tantra as a suffix to whatever the text is named. So what does that word Tantra mean? It means just book. No, it's just a type of book. But there's so many of them. And they're, each of these books, they offer their own kind of theology, their own metaphysics, their own way of looking at this mystery called life. And um, some of them are dualistic in that they believe there is a universe and apart from the universe, there is a creator deity who caused the universe. Some of them are qualified non-dualist, meaning they believe that there is a creator deity and only that creator deity exists, but this world is the body of that deity. And everything that you see around you is a discrete, very real part of some unified whole. 
some vishesha purusha or some special spirit then there is the non dual side that says no uh, the seeming multiplicity is a seemingness alone an appearance and in actuality only awareness exists and there are all these different approaches abhinava gupta the great polymath of uh, kashmir in the 10th century wrote a text tantraloka and he took all of these different schools of philosophy and using the trident of shiva as we discussed last night systematized them into one cohesive whole and he says um it's a graded approach it's not like these are different philosophies they're each of them appealing to different people on different stages of the path and ultimately the truth is beyond any category of duality or non duality existence or non existence it's beyond any vada or philosophical school but and this is why i wanted to explain this before we did our chant abhinava gupta first and foremost is a shaiva you know he's a shaiva of the shaivas he was initiated into 17 lineages all of them were shaiva lineages and so he um uses as his fulcrum the image of shiva but when he says shiva he means like brahman though with certain nuances he means the formless awareness but naturally in talking about that formless awareness in expressing the joy of resting in that formless awareness he appeals to popular shaiva imagery like tridents and jackals and cremation grounds and yogis and matted hair and and all of that you know his language is predominantly shaiva and by that i mean it's wild and ecstatic and uses terms of power and frenzy and ecstasy and inebriation and intoxication but all of it in a very mortuary and morbid way oh well, it's very exciting um so that's why this chant will be a chant to shiva it's actually the opening hymn from kshema raja which is abhinava's foremost disciple this is shema raja's invocatory hymn to his wonderful text pratya bigya hridaya sutra i bring up shema raja today because we're going to close our meditation with some readings from the shiva sutra vali of utpala deva who shema raja uh, uh, interprets and comments on so let's begin this is an invocation to shiva i'll do um first and foremost from the taittiriya upanishad i'll do the uh one of the gayatri mantras of shiva one of the five gayatri mantras then i will do the mahamrityunjaya mantra then i will do shema raja's opening invocation and then we'll begin our class okay so if it feels appropriate to you let's come and sit up straight with the spine long and the chest broad sitting up tall and alert as if we mean to encounter that which is truly sacred in us and so as you inhale find that majesty and poise in the spine if it feels appropriate you can bring the hands over the heart in the namaste or namaskar mudra anjali mudra it's called and if it feels appropriate you might tuck the chin bowing to that which is sacred to you i'll inhale to om now you might join me in your own space if you'd like oh तत्पुषा विदे महादेवाय धीम तो रुद्रा प्रचोदया ओं त्रियंबगम यजामहे सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धन उर्वाकम बंधन मृत्योर्मुक्षीयृता नम शिवाय सतत पंचक्रिथ्याने चिदानंदगन स्वात्मा परमातव भासिने ओम सैल्यूटेशंस टू दैट फॉर्मलेस स्पिरिट द ग्रेट गॉड शिवा मे माय माइंड बी इल्यूमाइंड बाय शिवा सैल्यूटेशंस टू शिवा रिमूव मी फ्रॉम माय बॉन्डेज ओ लॉर्ड एज थाउ माइट्स रिमूव अ क्यूकंबर फ्रॉम इट्स स्टेम दैट आई मे अटेन टू इटर्नल लाइफ एंड लास्टिंग जॉय Om salutations to Shiva who alone exists who exists in the form of pure awareness saturated with joy who is none other than my very own essence nature who in each and every moment of my experience is congealing a world maintaining a world and dissolving a world for no other reason than for the sake of his own endless sport salutations to that Shiva that verily I am Om shanti 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 may this be an offering to parama shiva jai mahakala so let's begin our meditation by considering the four types of meditation or three types of meditation that we are going to do today 
So within the hour, I want to just like briefly give you a tour of the three modes of meditation that exist within this mode called Shaivism. You know, so Abhinava Gupta, beyond just like synthesizing all the different types of philosophies into one theoretical cohesion, he also takes all the various practices and puts them into these neat three categories, the three spokes of the trident of Shiva. And um, this, this kind of classification of practices helps us see what a practice does, what it can accomplish and who it's for. So very briefly, the first of these three is called Shambhava Upaya, which means the way of Shiva. In my opinion, this is perhaps the unique feature of Shaivism. Um, and we won't get into the theology of, of this approach. But today, in my opinion, this approach is distinctive of Shaivism and it gives you the most room for exploration, experimentation and self uh, inquiry. So Shambhava Upaya, Shambhava means blessing. And, and Shambhava Upaya means, um, the way of blessing or the way of Shiva. You recall the central claim of Shaivism is that God is formless awareness and that you are God and that this world is an expression of that God for no other reason than for fun and for play. So each moment in each and every cognition, awareness is spewing forth that particular cognition. So right now, as you are hearing these words, the formless awareness that you are is emanating forth a zoom screen and upon that Zoom screen are other people, and there is some fellow gesticulating wildly and talking at you. So all of this is in your experience now. Why? Because it's Shiva pouring forth into this existence through you. For what? For you. So you can have this experience. How long will you have this experience? For just as long as you want to have it. At any time, you can leave the meeting, you can close your eyes and go, arr, 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 and not listen to anything. You know, you can get up and walk out of the room, or you can just check out, you know, your attention can go to tomorrow's lunch or yesterday's fight with husband or something. Your mind can just check out and go somewhere else. You always have that freedom. Like Sisyphus push pushing up the rock, the body, hands, the feet might be doing something, but you are absolutely free in, in, in either making meaning of your experience or just like saying peace out, Audi 5 Tao and going and, and, and living somewhere else in your mind. Even though your body is here, you might not be. So how long will this experience last? Well, only as long as you want it to, as long as you pay attention to it, as long as you keep your interest here. So not only did Shiva create this experience, he's also maintaining this experience. Awareness is maintaining this experience using the power of attention. Then when will this experience end? Well, when you choose for it to end. And, and by the way, I'm not saying when you yourself hit the leave meeting button, even if I do it, if I end the meeting, you chose it. And that, that we can really, we really have to get into what that means, but we won't do it today. So everything that happens, technically you chose it. Bernal might not have chosen it. And many times, Kat's will and Nisha's will might be totally contrary to Shiva's will. But ultimately you are Shiva. So if you know that, you'll be in perfect accordance with everything that happens to you, including my like turning off the meeting right now. And some of you are like, oh, this is interesting. I want to do this. And I turn off the meeting and you're like, oh man, what a jerk. That would, that Shiva wanted to do that. Maybe Nishan, but Shiva, yeah, test run, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, test run, <laughs> Tori. <laughs> so yeah, bye. And then just, and <laughs> so Shiva wanted to do that. And, and why? Because that was when Shiva moved from one experience to another, or he decided to enter into Samadhi and uh, absolve himself of all experiences. These are the three things that awareness can do. It can create experience, it can sustain an experience, and it can dissolve an experience. Why does it do any of these three things? For fun. Then. Um, in, these, in these three events, there is always an opportunity to be aware that these three things are happening through Shiva. If you are aware of that, if you are awake to the miracle of life emanating itself into existence through you, you will experience what in this tradition is called anugraha, grace, singular grace, the grasping of the truth. You will see that you are that awareness and this world is nothing other than your own very expression for the sake of your own creativity then you will be excited and full of joy. So even in the midst of grief, if you can truly see that this is the play of Shiva, this is the expression of the Lord in that moment, and you are none other than the Lord, then ah, it becomes entertainment and merriment to you. And also, because you know you are the Lord, awareness itself, you no longer feel like you are just this body and mind. Yes, you are this body and mind. It's not an appearance. It's a very real expression, a node in a shifting sea of nodes and relations that makes up the spanda, the vibration of Shiva. But if you know that you are Shiva, 
If you know you are the whole, the pattern of all vibrations, the sum total of all souls, then your emphasis on this particular fellow, this particular soul will be dramatically lessened, enabling you to feel a lot more peace and calmness about your life. A lot more selflessness. Then you can enjoy it. You truly enjoy your life. So that's one thing, grace. But the opposite of grace, nigraha, is when in the midst of creating an experience or maintaining an experience or um, ending an experience, you forget that you are the one creating, maintaining, and ending those experiences. That is what is called bondage. When you forget that you are Shiva, when you take yourself to be this individual who is at the whim and mercy of the universe, then you're in trouble because you forget about your own power. Now, look at it this way. Something happens to you, right? In an absolute sense, you who are Shiva have caused that thing to happen to you who are Nish. Sure. But from the point of view of Nish, even as a bound soul, even if Nish doesn't know he's a Shiva, what, or Shiva, sorry, not a Shiva. I mean, there are several Shivas, by the way, in the hierarchy of, although it's all one non-dual thing, it, it gets very dicey because in this non-duality, there are modes of expression of relative contraction and expansion. So we won't go there. I keep saying I, we won't go there and then I want to and then I sometimes, so let's restrain ourselves. No, we won't go there. It, yeah, there's tattvas full of, everything is Shiva, but there are different expressions. So even if Nish doesn't know he's Shiva in any capacity, if he thinks he's Nish, even then, pancha kritiyani karoti, even then, he still has Shiva's power to interpret the way he wants about his experience. This is Camus' insight. You know, I'm free to make any kind of meaning. It's called kalpana in Sanskrit. I have the creative power to package, uh, 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 represent, represent that reality to me any way I want. So I'm free to see this as a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing. I'm free to not see it if I want to go into meditation. I'm free to see it more if I focus on it more. So that's, that's my power, you know, like Nish himself. Yeah, right. Nish himself has the power to do that. Not like it doesn't even depend on me realizing I'm Shiva. When I do realize I'm, I'm Shiva, oh, that's the ultimate reconceptualization, right? Then I won't even need to like, oh, reposition myself with regards to my event. It will just be raw, immediate reality. Each moment fresh, ever arising joy. Okay. But if I forget this power, if I forget that I am the creator of my reality, if I forget that I am the one that's generating this particular experience, then I'm in bondage. This is called nigraha. So there are these five things, right? To be awake to these five things happening, creation, maintenance, dissolution, self-revelation, and self-concealment, to be aware of that in each and every cognition is what it is to be enlightened in this tradition. Okay, that's the first point. The second point, so any practice then, so now that you know what this tradition considers enlightenment, to be Shiva himself, the, the second point to make then is that every practice that we do must be measured in terms of how close it gets you to that goal. So a practice is only effective insofar as it awakens you to your innate Shiva nature. It shows you that you are congealing a world and all that. So once you know the goal, now you can assess the practice. Yes. The third thing is, and this is perhaps most important, theologically speaking, Shiva nature uh, or, or awareness or the goddess awareness, Chitti, Kali, Mahashakti, um, is pregnant with potentialities. Just as you, your body have so many potentialities. People can pull um, what do you call it? They can pull the aeroplane. Have you seen that? Like I've seen people in India um, and in Malaysia and Batu caves, like do crazy stuff. Like they'll pull a chariot with their tongue with like people on it. You know, if you ask Nish, can you pull the chariot with your tongue? Absolutely not. The chariot will pull my tongue out. And that's probably a mercy to all of you. And right? I won't spew Shaivism at you every day as much as I do now. So, um, but there are people who, I don't know, the tongue doesn't come out of their mouth. They can pull it. How? Well, David Blaine, I don't know, Chris, Chris Angel, Mind Freak, you know, like all these people, they just seem to be able to do stuff through training, through um, willpower, all of that. Hello, Casey, welcome. Talking some Shaivism today. I'm so happy you're here. Sent the email, patting the cat. Casey is living her best life. <laughs> Wait, I just saw that it didn't send. So I feel like, I don't know. Maybe like I should review it. I think I did no. it a little too spontaneously. <laughs> well, no, spontane we're just talking Shaivism. So we're just about to like talk about spontaneity as being the best mode of being in the world. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yes, no, read it over. I'll have, I'll proofread it for you if you want, but don't, don't stress. Just send it. Like Kat, Kat knows. Kat sent Swami Sarvadevananda um, an email and his response reminded Kat how loving and spacious the uh, uh, figure this is. You don't have to worry. He's already your very own, like, brother, father, you know, like this. Story. Okay, so mother. He's more of a mother than anything. Anyway, um, so returning to our, to our narrative. 
there are people who can do stuff with the body that other people can't. Why? Because those potentialities were in the body. Even though no one brought them forth before that particular person, those potentialities were there. Like Nikola Tesla didn't invent magnetism, right? Electromagnetism was something that Nikola Tesla uh, manifested. In other words, he noted it. He saw it in his calculations, in his reasoning. And apparently he was walking in the park with a friend one day talking about Goethe or something. And when this insight came about electromagnetism, he fell to his knees and scribbled something in the sand. And apparently he said famously, I have wrested from nature one of her secrets, which I think is a beautiful idea that this secret was already there in nature as the banyan tree is there within its seed. And Nikola Tesla was the Shakti, you know, the Shakti that brought forth that potentiality in Mahashakti. So Nikola Tesla himself is a particular Shakti of Shiva. He is a node. Now Shiva is Nikola Tesla, right? Nikola Tesla is Shiva with the talent of being a brilliant scientist. I mean, many people considered him a magician, a wizard, a, a mystic. So he had the Shakti of clear thought. You know, thinking, proper thinking is a Shakti. Great singing is a Shakti. Beauty is a Shakti. These are all things that people have to manifest potentialities of Shiva. So Nikola Tesla, using his individual Shakti of brilliance, was able to, uh, in some sense, invent electromagnetism for all of us. He changed the world of physics, of, of, of technology uh, for everybody. So that is Shiva's play. You see, Shiva can do that, and he's got this potentiality. So we say then each individual is Shiva, and as such, there are innumerable potentialities in that person. These practices that we're discussing today, yeah, exactly. These practices we're discussing today are three ways to bring those potentialities forth. And so remember, if the goal in Kashmiri Shaivism is to recognize yourself as Shiva, then all practices must be judged by their efficacy in bringing that about, in causing and triggering this recognition of your Shiva nature when all the time. In each moment, you must know that you are Shiva and see how Shiva is playing through you. Okay. Now, that being said, about Shambhava Upaya itself, you can never define what Shambhava Upaya is. So in some sense, our practice today um, is kind of confusing because what will I tell you to do? In fact, we've already been practicing something like Shambhava Upaya. For those of you who have been attentive to your experience, there have been a million and one openings into awareness already without any kind of cue whatsoever. And you might've found out on your own, you might've felt this, oh, you know, this glimpse into something more expansive. What is Shambhava Upaya? Shambhava Upaya, the way of Shiva, is a spontaneous awakening into wordless wonder at the recognition of your true nature as formless awareness, all pervasive, congealing into everything in the field of your experience. Hmm? That is Shambhava Upaya. Where did that definition of Shambhava Upaya come from? Shiva, right? You just wait and you, you see what Shiva will say and spontaneously you see what will come out. And if it sounds like poetry, I'm patting myself on the back a little bit here, but if it sounds nice, if it sounds articulate, if it sounds like poetry, you're in the flow and Shiva is expressing himself. But if it's distorted, if it's jangled, if it's mangled, if it doesn't sound you harmonic, if it doesn't sound euphonious, then it's not Shiva. Then it's like the individual kind of trying to get something from someone. So this is, this is key. Like you saw with Tesla and electromagnetism, there are infinite potentialities in Shiva since Shiva is an infinite being. Awareness is full of potentialities. Now, given that, there are infinite practices in the realm of Shambhava Upaya. You can come up with millions of them. That's why we were saying to Bernala yesterday, we don't really need to go through each one in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. You know, there are 112 of them here. We don't need to do that because we just need to know how they did it, how they came up with these practices. Then we can put all the books away and then just do it ourselves. We can turn everything into a practice. This goes way beyond the mindfulness of like modern new age circles. It's something like that, but it's more like as Lakshmanju Swamiji would say, uh, no mind, you know, it's like unminding the mind. You know, in each moment you sip tea and the mind should be obliterated by the sipping of the tea. You should become the tea, you should become the world. But look, if you don't have this theology, if you don't understand Shaivism, at least on an intellectual level, then mindfulness will be very dull and inert. So all those people practicing mindfulness, no doubt it's improving the quality of their life a little bit. But notice they go back to being the same asshole they were once they put the teacup down. What did mindfulness really do for you except make the tea a little bit better, make you a little more present so you can enjoy some sensual thing? So for what? To be craving more sensual things? I don't know. For mindfulness to really affect you in the way that Shaivism wants it to, you must be aware as to what you're trying to achieve here. So we're going to practice Shambhava Upaya in a little bit. And the goal here is to recognize your innate Shiva nature. 
And we'll see how we can do that in several ways. Okay, now, because Shiva nature is infinite, as I'll say again, you invent your own Shambhava bias. You, you find your own opportunities for awakening. And in truth, each moment is just such an opportunity. That's the key. So when we ask, okay, what is Kashmir Shaiva, Shaiva meditation? What's the approach of Kashmir Shaivism? This is it. Anything goes. Everything is as good as anything else, as a method, as a means, as a way to awaken to truth. For only truth is, and everything that you're seeing, whether you know it or not, is already truth. You don't have to become, yes, pet a flower. I love that. Pet a flower. <laughs> That's so good. Just even the phrase, pet a flower. Where did that come from? From Shiva. So like this, we're all just kind of spontaneously expressing. Okay. Uh, needless to say, Shiva then is extemporaneous um, music, dance, speech. Shiva is essentially extemporaneous, spontaneous living. What does that require? It requires surrender and it requires trust. If you can surrender to Shiva, to awareness, then awareness will live you. You don't have to do anything. What do I mean by this? Let's say your life is falling apart right now, right? Shiva's game is to like wreck your shit. Your life is falling apart right now. If you truly let go, if you stop trying to put your life back together, if you stop trying to like apply the bandaid or control your life, if you truly surrender and then you just sit down and you accept it, you say, this is the will of the Lord. Shiva, what a, what a fierce game you are enacting through me. If you can say that, then here's what will happen. If you open up to Shiva, what will happen is there will be some subtle impulse arising within you that will effortlessly move your hands, your feet, and your mouth into some action that will put your life back together. So that's the thing. No harm can come to you insofar as you're truly living in the flow of Shiva. And these practices, hopefully, should make that more true for you. So as you practice Shaivism, Kashmir Shaivism, you practice all the meditations we're going to offer, you should hopefully see this more in, in each and every one of your days. Yes, Tori, thank you. Thank you, right, Tori, for the testimony. And now watch how she puts it all back together, just for fun. It's all her play. Okay, so Shambhava Upaya, we'll start with Shambhava Upaya. And most of our class today for the next 30 minutes will be Shambhava Upaya, you know? And uh, maybe actually 20, and then we'll read Shiva Sutra Vali a bit. So most of it will be Shambhava Upaya. Then the next Upaya is what? Remember, Shambhava Upaya is just opening up to grace. It's not something that you do. Um, it's more about um, noticing the awareness in which an experience vibrates, whatever that experience might be. So it's a meditation on awareness, or it's an opening up or a surrendering to that awareness. This is Shambhava Upaya, okay? Now, the next thing to consider is Shakt Upaya. Shakt Upaya is the way of Shakti. This is the way of philosophy. You'd be surprised to hear that, right? I think most people think when we say Shaktupaya, you think like dance or something embodied like that. And, and that's actually Anava Upaya. That's the way of the individual, or the way of the atom. Anu means atom. So Anava Upaya means the way of the atom, the way of you, the atomized being. Shaktupaya is not about dance and shit, actually. It's subtle. Shaktupaya is about thinking. It's just about philosophy. Doing philosophy is Shaktupaya. So what we're doing now is Shaktupaya. For instance, if I said to you, this world is not an effect of some cause called God. I'm giving you a thought now, right? This is also a Shambhava Upaya because if you can just hear my thought and be like, I don't care what at, at all what that means, but look, a sound. And ah, I am the awareness in which that sound is vibrating. Poof, instant awakening, right? So you can turn this statement. This is not an effect. This universe is not an effect for which there is some being called God who is the cause. That is a teaching and it can be a Shambhava Upaya. How do I make it a Shaktupaya? If I actually prove it. If I say, okay, look at this. Here is consciousness. God is the ultimate intelligence. God is the supreme consciousness, right? And in all your doctrines, you are saying this intelligence, this cosmic consciousness creates a world and then stands apart from that world, right? And you're like, yes, yes, I'm a dualist. These are my doctrines. It says Asma Prabhu Hara, you know, Shiva Hara is the Lord because he created the world. Shiva Bodha Gyana, the first verse in Shiva Bodha, Bodha Gyana, foundational text in Shaivism, claims that Shiva created the world. Shiva is God, the world is his effect. Karana Karya Vada, the effect, uh, the cause and gives birth to the effect. Okay, now I say, wait, if God is consciousness, how can there be an effect that is apart from consciousness? Because then you're saying it's outside of consciousness. And if something is outside of consciousness, how will you verify its existence? So if the world is an effect, 
it cannot be an effect in the sense that it is some other thing, some secondary category, apart from this primary category of intelligence, of consciousness. So that means there is only one category, the cause, and the effect is within the cause. But if the effect and cause aren't two different things, then there is no effect, and the cause is no longer a cause. The world is therefore an appearance, right? Like that. Or if I said, oh, here, take a pot. Is there a pot apart from the clay that makes it? And you'd be forced to say, no, because if you said yes, then I could say, okay, you take the pot, I'll keep the clay. And you can never do that. You can never show the clay apart from the pot. What are you doing now? You're thinking. This is philosophy, right? And you ask questions. You'd be like, but no, surely there's a name and a form there that's real. And, and, and the philosopher will laugh and say, show me then. Prove to me that there is a form apart from the clay. In the same way, prove to me that there is a world apart from consciousness. Prove to me that consciousness can be objectified because who then is the one pointing to this new thing called consciousness? Like that. This is all philosophy. Why do you do it? You do it because it prepares you for Shambhava Upaya. You know? The more Shaivism you understand, the more of Shiva's nature you can investigate through scripture, and we'll read Shiva Sutra Vali today, the, the better a position you'll be in to appreciate Shiva's uh, spontaneous emergence in each and every one of your moments. That's Shaktapaya. But what if we can't do philosophy? Like, what if this stuff is just too difficult and, and just boring and we're just not interested in it? Then what? Is there no hope for us? There is. Anava Upaya. That's what we do on Wednesdays when we do Hatha Yoga. These poses purify the body. We do Pranayama. We regulate the breath and breathe in certain ways. Um, and we visualize. We visualize like light and chakras and we say mantras. Primarily, Anava Upaya is mantra chanting of mantras and even the vibrating of mantras in certain places in the body as Casey and I were discussing earlier this morning the idea of using the body as a, a map of reality that's all anava upaya so typically what people consider embodied spiritual practice what people typically relate with like shakti and, and embodiment that's all anava upaya the way of the atom and the way of the individual so you could say this right very briefly Anava Upaya is anything that you can do that other people can see or that involves your like literal doing. You know, so you could say puja, bandha, mudra, all of these things, people can see it, right? That's Anava Upaya. It's the most inferior form of practice, but we all have to start there. Shaktupaya is subtler. Nobody can see it, uh, but it's still something that you're doing. Shambhava Upaya is the subtlest because nobody can see it, not even you. And you can't do it. It depends solely on Shiva. You know? So look, it's degrees of control. If you move away from you towards Shiva, you are moving from Anava to Shambhava by way of Shakti. So in the Vijnana Bhairava, you'll hear so many lines that say, ah, then the Bhairava nature is revealed by means of Shakti. Like that. Okay. So shall we do it? Come. This is a paradox. Shall we do it? I don't know. We've been doing it. There's nothing else to do. But if you want, take any position of the body that you like. You can lie down, you could stand up, you can, I don't know, dance, you can run about, doesn't matter what you do. So do whatever you want. No person in a yoga class ever wants to hear that. All the cameras go off at that point. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm just kidding. You can have them off, it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, yes. So um, typically we will take a meditation pose. You know, so typically for best results, might as well treat it like an Anava Upaya. We'll come and sit in a, pose proper. So let's take a meditation pose now. Anything that you like. And see to it that you are comfortable. That's the main thing in this Anava Upaya, Shakti Upaya, in Shambhava Upaya, whatever it is, there must be some sukha to it, some, some joy. Because remember, it is only for joy that Shiva does this at all. Put that down on the floor. Okay, so coming and finding your pose, relax. There can be no Shambhava Upaya, there can be no grace without some level of surrender. Grace can be there in periods of tremendous anxiety, fear. It can be there in the midst of a sneeze. It can be there when you're running away from the battlefield. These are all literal things that are said in the Vijnana Bhairava, the practice manual that we're studying. But for now, given that you are in a room perhaps or outdoors in some relative safety and privacy, for now, just relax. And by that, I mean, start to unclench the jaw, 
soften the corners of the mouth. Let the tongue rest upon the bed of the mouth. And let the eyeball slacken from behind closed eyelids or half closed eyelids. Let the eyeballs just point towards the space just in front of the nose and then leave them there. Leave the eyeballs alone. And as you relax your jaw and mouth and eyes, also relax your neck. Softening at the base of the neck, you should feel your shoulder heads melt down away from the ears a smidgen. Your hands can be on the knees, they can be in your lap, palms can be face up on the thighs or face down, whatever you'd like to do. You might even like a mudra, some of you, you know, choosing whatever mudra, you can just sit there and do whatever you want with your hands, but see to it at least that you're comfortable in this moment. The least you can think of the body in this moment, the best. Though, of course, there are Shambhava Upayas that wholly involve sensation and embodiment. The one we're going to do today is best practiced when the body is comfortable and not demanding your attention. If it feels comfortable, you can close the eyes. Or as we said earlier, you can keep them half opened. Or if you want, you can have them open all the way. It matters little. Though many people find that they can go deeper into their subjective experience if their eyes are closed, at least in the beginning. So those who are new to meditation practice, who are only now beginning to savor their subjective sense of being alive, then it might be nice to close the eyes. And experts alike, you know, it's nice to close the eyes, at least at first. And now the Shambhava Upaya. Start to open the ears to the totality of sounds around you. So become fascinated with each and every sound that is independently cognized by you in this moment. Start by labeling them. The sound of voice coming from the computer. The sound of engine revving up on the street outside. The sound of leaky kitchen tap dripping. The sound of bird song, voices in the other room, traffic in the distance, etc. Play this game of trying to notice as many individual and discrete sounds as you can manage to notice. And it's okay if you label them at first. So you can assign the label car siren or fish tank gurgling or something. You can assign that label because even that, that kalpana, that conception is itself an emanation and expression of chitti, of goddess awareness, of Shiva, of Shakti. So don't see anything as bad. These thoughts themselves are Shakti. So it's okay to label these experiences give them names, and you might even have stories about each of these experiences. You might think, ah, leaky kitchen tap. 
wasn't there that old feng shui maxim about if your kitchen tap is leaking, then money will leak out of your life, something, you know, you might do that. You might start cogitating, at least at first. So give yourself the space to do that. But now, gently shift your attention away from the label and the story and move that attention towards the raw and immediate storyless perception of that sound, any sound. Imagine you are a baby and you are hearing each of these sounds as if for the first time. What is the texture, timbre, and quality of that sound before the mind co-ops it with a label and with a story? And notice that you have infinite opportunities to catch this moment when the sound turns into a thought in your perceptual, conceptual mechanism known as the mind. If you can, you will listen for the roar timbre of my voice beyond its meaning, apart from its meaning. And then you will also become aware of what these words mean to you, of what you think about them. It's hard to do this practice with words since words come with so many stories already. So it's better now to take the next few moments in silence and do this practice with each sound that is non-verbal, not made by a human throat, but made by machines, by beasts, by the city itself, by the forest, wherever you might find yourself in this moment. And again, your task, if we can even call it that, is to simply appreciate the raw and immediate storyless sensation of each discrete sound that appears simultaneously or sequentially in your experience of this moment. Should you find yourself thinking again, just notice that and bring your attention back to the activity or the non-activity of listening for the raw, immediate, storyless sensation of each and every discrete sound in this moment. And now notice if subtler sounds, sounds that were previously unrecognized, notice if they're becoming more available to you. In other words, this moment, if you're practicing correctly, and there's no correct way to do this, but if you're opening up to it, this moment will present you with infinite richness. Notice that there is a ceaseless symphony with infinite depth unfurling before your very ears in this moment. There are the obvious sounds like the voice from your computer, the sounds on the street, but then there are subtler sounds, 
like maybe the hissing of the radiator or the creaking of the house floorboards, the rustle of silk on your skin. And yet subtler sounds like the beating of your heart, the humming and hawing of this machine called a body. And even beyond that subtler sound, astral sound, the sounds of each of these cerebrospinal centers known as chakras, there are infinite sounds and each of them appearing to you in increasing degrees of subtlety as you become more and more invested in this simple exercise of opening up to the totality of sounds that are present in your experience. But let's move on. So you can stay with this exercise for as long as you want, simply listening. You'll know that you're quote unquote doing it right if you can start to feel this wonderment, this childlike sense of innocence and joy. If there is a beauty and a depth and a kind of simple veracity to your experience, then you know, okay, it's happening. And if it's not happening, be excited about that too. Moving on though, the next practice in Shambhava Upaya is this. As you sit here and listen, your raw, immediate, storyless sense of a sound almost immediately, unless you're a skilled meditator, turns into a thought or a story. But even that thought and even that story has a sensation. It's a second order sensation or an emergent sensation. So for instance, the, the, the sound might be dog barking. Of course, that's not the sound. The sound is something that cannot be named. It's wordless. The thought is dog barking. And the associated story is my neighbor really has to put a muzzle on that thing. <laughs> so there are three things. Shabda, Artha, the sound and its meaning. The dog's bark, your name, dog bark, and the story or the kind of content of what it means to be hearing that sound in this moment. In this moment, there might be another third order thinking faculty that says, I am wrong for thinking about this story when I really should be meditating. Dispense with that. Or even if that's there, relegate it to the second order sensation of thought. This sounds complex, but really what we're saying is be more interested in the context of the thought and less interested in its content. So if you think the thought, my neighbor needs to control her dog, be more interested in just the texture of that thought. How does it feel to think that thought in this moment? You know, does that thought have a certain consistency, a certain energetic quality? Does it enliven you? Does it increase your energy? Does it excite you? Or does it constrain you and constrict you and overwhelm you or underwhelm you or depress you? Whatever it might be. Just become interested in the fact of your experience beyond the what of your experience. This is called in Tantra, un mesha dasha nishevana, meaning paying attention to the immersion, oh, sorry, emergence of any new spontaneous feeling state. So as sounds come up one after another, there is an unmesha, a kind of bubbling forth of experience from the depths of awareness. Pay attention to that unmesha, the way it rises up to the surface of your cognition, seemingly from deep within your very own being. An expert Shaiva knows the sound of the dog next door is itself coming from deep within my being. For my being is the all-encompassing Shiva out of which everything, in which everything has its existence, out of which everything came and into which everything dissolves. But for beginners, you might work best with inner states like emotions and thoughts. The dog barking next door might not feel like it's coming from the depths of your being, but your thoughts are, your emotions are, they seem to emerge seemingly out of nowhere. Try to catch their moment of emergence 
and pay attention not only to their vibration while they're there, but also to their moment of disappearance. This is called Unmesha Dasha Nishevana, paying attention to the subtle transitions between an emotion and a thought, between a thought and thoughtlessness, between one emotion state and another emotion state, etc. If you think you need silence to practice Shambhava Upaya, you are gravely mistaken. This practice can happen in the midst of Manhattan Square. Just pay attention to your subjective experience as often as you can think to do it. That's all this practice requires. Be more interested in you, the subject, the that of your experience, and be less interested in you, the object, the what of your experience. Both are you. But this is the way of Shiva, so focus on your Shiva nature, not your Pashu or animal nature, which is not different from you, just a lower emanation or lower contracted vibration of what you at your essence are. So with that, I'm going to leave you to practice the Shambhava Upaya as thus expounded. Remember that from what we've said so far, you can yourself derive countless varied ways to practice. So one way might be to start listening for the breath. This is called the ajapa japa, the um, unrepeated repetition of a mantra. And if you listen to the breath, you'll hear that the inhale has a certain sound. So And the exhale has another sound. <sighs> I'm vocalizing it, but it's not like that. It's just a sound. Hum sa or so hum. That means so hum is I, that I am. And hum sa means I am that. So Shiva am I, I am Shiva. The mantra so hum or hum sa is naturally recurring without you needing to mentally recite it or think about it or use a japa mala or sing it or say it. All of that would be anava upaya. But here in our shambhava upaya practice, you are not reciting a mantra as such. You are listening for the mantra as it spontaneously recurs in the experience of listening to your breath. So some of you might like to focus on the breath as a sound and do this ajapa japa. Listen to the so hum or the hum sa like that. Others amongst you might just be listening and yet others amongst you might be doing unmesha dasha nishevana, tracking the state of transition between one emotion state and another, between boredom and excitement, excitement and despair, confusement and enlightenment, enlightenment and self-forgetting like that. Watch the way she is dancing. In her myriad forms, she presents before you an ever varied and ever new and ever fluctuating variegated dance of pure ecstasy. She is reeling drunk, turning this way, turning that way, completely thrashing the Buddhistic notion of cause and effect, for she is a radically undetermined, free-moving particle of objective awareness. So like that, enjoy her dance. And to close, I will now in the final few moments, read to you a little bit from the Shiva Stotra Vali. So I'll start. Um, this is chapter four of Utpala Devas, Shiva Sutra Vali, which means the hymns, uh, a garland of hymns for Shiva. Uh, but his hymns are, of course, poems that he strings together in a garland and gives to Shiva, the formless awareness. So this is chapter four, called the Sura Sodbala Stotra. Bala means strength. So this is the strength of the divine nectar. Surasa. Su means good, rasa means taste. So this is the strength of the um, good tasting him. Chapalam asiya dapi manasa. 
Tatrapi Shlagya se Yatoba Jase Shara Nama Pisharanam Tribuvana Guru Mambika Kantam. O oh my mind, although you are flickering, always restless, yet you are glorified because at times, whenever you direct your nature towards the remembrance of Lord Shiva, you direct it wholeheartedly, so you are glorified. You are victorious because you achieve the nearness of Lord Shiva, the master of the three worlds. Spiritually, the world of wakefulness, the world of dreaming, and the world of dreamless sleep. In the beginning, you must achieve Swapna Swa Tantriya, mastery over the dreaming state. That is, you dream only whatever you wish to dream according to your own choice and not according to the choice of Niyati, niyati Shakti of Lord Shiva. Next, you must achieve mastery over Shushupti, the state of sound dreamless sleep. Mastering the state of sound sleep means to be aware that you are Shushupti peacefully as long as you remain in Shushupti. That is Vijnana Kala, to have lucid deep sleep. Having attained mastery over these two states, you can gain mastery over the state of wakefulness. And when you have once gained mastery over wakefulness, you are none other than Lord Shiva. You are Lord Shiva himself. So I'm reading to you now some of Swami Lakshmanju's commentary, and we are using his um, translation of the Shiva Sutravali. Okay, verse two. Oh Lord, this is the story of great torture for me. I have crossed all those steps of yogic exercises aforementioned, yogic practices, all sadhanas, and have come to the supreme state, the uppermost limit of the stepless state. And not only that, I have achieved I have touched the lotus feet of Lord Shiva also, but still I go after the worldly sensuous pleasures. After achieving this highest state also, I still hanker after these worldly pleasures. This is the state of my torture. Verse three, oh my Lord, oh my master, there is but one request for you. Keep your avenues open for me for the time being as long as I would pass through them and reach your lotus feet. And simultaneously, keep all the doors of the world of torture, the world of differentiated perception, the world of hankering after sensual pleasures, closed for the time being as long as I would become your slave. Till then, you have to do these two things for me. Namely, keep your avenues wide open and simultaneously keep those hindrances and diversions at bay. Always attentive, I want to serve you wholeheartedly. This is only pleasure for me. Oh Lord Shiva, oh Shambhu, oh Shankara, O oh, beloved of those who have sought refuge in you, please bestow your grace upon me quickly. Don't hesitate to bless me right now, because if you don't bless me soon, I will be blessed automatically, as it is because I crave so much to get your blessing that I can't remain without it. I can't live without your grace. O oh, master, your shining form is soaked with the supreme nectar of joy and ecstasy. And it appears to me sometimes. It appears to me momentarily, just like the lightning of clouds finished in a flash. Before I can get to worship you, it is gone. Now, O oh Master, I would like to perceive that formation which is soaked in that supreme nectar. And I would like to remain established for some more time, to remain stationary for some more time and not go away quickly, just as lightning. Oh Lord, then I would be able to worship you. When I perceive you, when I see the flash of lightning, I want to worship you. But before I can do that, it is gone. How can I worship you, O oh Lord? If it remained for some more time, then I would be able to worship thee. So please do that for me. It is not so much a job for you. You could very easily do it. I have never told you to put me on the road to your spiritual abode. I have never asked you to carry me on thy path. You have done it yourself. You have put me on the path and now you are refusing to appear. 
If I have been kept and carried on thy path, why do I act like ordinary worldly people? Why don't I sing in that glamour of thy glory, filled with consciousness and bliss? How is it? This is thy greatness, O Lord, O Master, that in the hearts of those blessed devotees of thine, such fineness of thy devotion appears, that although they are away from thy consciousness, yet when some other person puts and explains the fineness of fineness of your joy and bliss before them, by hearing only, they get entry into goddess awareness at once. Such is the fineness of their heart that if they are only explained the ways of God consciousness by hearing alone the ways of God consciousness, they get entry into God consciousness. This is the fineness, fineness of the heart that they have acquired. O oh Lord, I pray that we may always savor thy flash of divine lightning in each and every cognition throughout each and every one of our days. O oh Lord, I, play, I pray that with each flash of that lightning, we are left soaked in thy splendor forevermore. May each flash of thy divine lightning awaken me to the truth of my own nature as being non-different from you, Lord Shiva. May I be changed and permanently transformed by each and every one of these flashes of lightning called spontaneous awakening into your essence nature. This is the prayer of Nishant, that he may remain ever immersed in this flash of lightning and that all all whom he comes into contact with may also be immersed forever in this flash of lightning. The prayer of Nishant is that this world is soaked in lightning, for what else could it be but the self-effulgent light ever luminous that is Shiva, none other than he, none other than he. All glories to Shiva, salutations to Shiva. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tat Sat Jai Shiva Shambho Jai Mahakala Om Shri Parameshwara Arpanam Mastu